ended Romans last week. We're starting a new sermon series. So we always um, talk about stewardship in October. And it's one of my favorite things to talk on, believe it or not, because it's so practical about what it means to live out our life. And we always try to take kind of a creative uh, in to talk about it. One year, I famously did a sermon series on trees, and I was like, no, really, this is also going to be about stewardship. And people were like, right, Meredith. Um, but the thing is, it's, there's so many different images that help us understand what this concept is. And this year, the image that we're unpacking for a month is light. Now, I realize this is a very overdone image, right? So this is not just Christianity. This is universally, if you go to, you know, any, any kind of concert, any kind of art thing, the light and darkness image is very, very commonly done. But the reason it's so common is because it is so fundamental to the way humans work. So when Jordan and I discovered camping recently, um, and we successfully did it, pregnant with two small children, and one of the things I forgot because I grew up in the city, was that darkness is a real thing when you get away from electricity. So the thing is, you and I have grown up with electric lights taken for granted. If you grew up in the city, those lights are everywhere. It never gets dark. You can turn off all the lights, you turn off all the exterior lights, and if you walk outside in Houston, it is still not dark, right? Um, we tried this, we tried yard camping with my kids, and I Um, I was walking down to the restrooms, and, and we are not like wilderness campers, right? This was a state park campground <laughs> with bathrooms and with electricity and with water. And so I was literally walking probably from here to the end of the sanctuary. Um, and I was like, I'm just going to go to the bathroom. I know exactly where it is. And I didn't bring a flashlight because it's literally here to the end of the sanctuary. But for the first time that I can remember... It was dark, dark. And you know what happens when it's dark, dark? You can't see anything, right? You get lost within five feet. You trip over things that you'd forgotten were there. And then when you start walking, you know it's just from here to there, but maybe you're walking that direction, or maybe you're walking that direction. You see, when there actually is no light, life as a human becomes kind of terrifying because we rely so fully on our sense of sight, um, that we don't actually know how to navigate the world when there isn't light. That image was very, very powerful for the ancient people, who obviously lived before the time of electricity, who would have known better than we do how to navigate at night, who would have known better than we do how the stars and the moon and all that can, can help you function, and yet, who knew intimately that night was a very, very dangerous time to try to be out and about because you couldn't see the world in which you live. And so because of that, light very early, for Jews, for Christians, as well as for every other human on the planet, became a very, very powerful symbol. What I want to unpack in this series is what it actually means for Christians because there's not only a description, there's also a mandate for us. Uh, you are the light of the world. And I think if we understand what Christians meant when they were using this symbol, that mandate becomes a lot more powerful for us as we try to figure out what being the light of the world actually meant. So what we're going to do this morning, I'm going to walk through light, Genesis to Revelation, hit on a few key passages, and unpack what this image actually means. And then the next three weeks, I'm going to be looking in depth at some of the passages that really, really focus in on it. Um, like the Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen the great light. Of course, Sermon on the Mount is a famous one. You are the light of the world. A city built on the hill cannot be hid. Uh, do not hide your light under a bushel basket. We'll be talking about that one. Um, and we'll, we'll be hitting on some others, but this morning what I want to do is I want to walk through the image of light as presented for us in the Bible. So, 
we start with the creation narrative. The creation narrative um, takes us back, obviously, to in the beginning. And, um, and there's a couple different things going on here. First of all, it is, it is, it is telling the story of how God made the world. The second thing, though, is that um, this was very likely, I mean, it's a very, very old story, but it was very likely written down about the time that the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. That's when a lot of the scriptures were written down. And one of the things that you have to understand about that is that the Babylonians worshipped the sun and the moon. Like many ancient cultures worship the sun and the moon, right? Because of Darkness is so scary, you worship the source of the light. Um, Watch what happens when the Jewish people tell the story of how God created the world. So we're in Genesis 1. Genesis 1. In the beginning... When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So the first thing created is light. Did you notice what has not been created yet? The sun. <laughs> Did you notice that? We, got, we haven't made the sun yet. We haven't made the moon yet. In fact, that comes down, I think, on day four. If you get down to verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let there be four signs and four seasons. For days, for years, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. That was day four. What is the implication here? is that the, the Jewish people are hammering in this concept that the source of light is not the sun. The source of the truth, so this is where we're getting into light as a symbolic concept, right? The source the, of life and light and goodness in the world is not actually the sun. The sun was created by God. The moon was created by God. In fact, God himself is the source of what we need when we, when we think about light. Now, I want to pause there for a second because what this is setting up is a very interesting dichotomy that you and I still fall into today, which is, do we run the risk of worshiping the creation rather than the creator? And that is what this is setting up. In the beginning, the first thing created was light. And where did it come from? It came from God. And then later we created the sun, and the sun is great, the sun is good. We created the moon, the moon is good. We created the stars, the stars are good. And yet, the source of it all is from God. The source of light is from God. And if you can imagine, you and I can't really imagine light without a light source, right? I mean, if we imagine light is coming from a lamp, or it's coming from a sun, or it's coming from a moon, and yet what Genesis is saying, no, 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 it comes from God. God is the true source of all that we need in this life. When people come to faith, and this is true, I've said this in multiple sermon series, because it's universally true, is people come to faith, it's usually because they need something, right? It's because there's something missing in their life, And so they're reaching out for something of something created. I need this. I need this. Our eyes are focused solely on the creation. And yet when we come to Christianity, Christianity points our direction back, not toward that which has been created, but toward the creator. Because the creator 
is the source of what we truly need. Now, think real quick about what light is. Light is not only um, makes the plants grow. Light is the ability to see the world the way it is. Light is the ability to see the world the way it is. When this room is dark, you can invent all kinds of things in your head about what is actually happening in this room. Trust me, walking through a church at night is very, very creepy. I've done it a lot. When the room is dark, you can invent all kinds of things that are happening in your head. This is why we have night lights for children, because when the room is dark, then all of a sudden monsters exist. And monsters didn't exist during the day, but they exist at night. And yet when the light comes, you have the ability to see the world as it actually is. The implication here in Genesis is that only through the person of God are you and I able to see the world as it actually is. Only from God are you and I able to see the world as it actually is. The darkness, the darkness not only makes you run into things, the darkness allows you to invent things in your mind. The darkness allows you to live in a world of your own imagining. The darkness breeds fears that may not exist and does not lead to appropriate fears when they do exist, right? If you are in the darkness and you are walking at the edge of a canyon, but you don't know the canyon's there, you're not afraid of it. The light, it was what allows you to see the world the way it is, to be fearful of what you should be fearful of, to be not fearful of what you don't need to fear, to be mindful of what you should be mindful of, and to not allow the delusion of your own imagination to create an experience for you that has no connection with reality at all. And what Genesis brings us back to is that the light comes from God. And when you and I can get in touch with the creator, then we can live in this world in the light. And then what's going to happen after Genesis 3 is this image of darkness comes in with the implication that if you and I are not in touch with the creator, then we live in a world of darkness, meaning we don't see the world the way it actually is. Meaning we live in a world where we are led by our own fears and imaginings. We live in a world where we don't fear the things we should fear, and we do fear things we shouldn't fear. We live in a world where we do not understand what reality actually looks like, and we live in a world where we are constantly stumbling over the right way to walk. And this ongoing image is going to be God brings light, and without God, all of creation is plunged into darkness. Now, here's how this image develops. In Exodus, we have the first example of God coming in person to rescue his people. If you remember, there was this whole slavery in Egypt thing. God's people were in slavery in Egypt, and God came and defeated Pharaoh and rescued his people. And in order to guide the people, he came with a pillar of light. Do you remember this? And the pillar of light guided the people so they, so the actual quote is, so they could travel through the night. They could see in the night. And that pillar of fire guided the people to the mountain of Sinai. And when the mountain of Sinai, um, there was thunder and there was lightning and God made a covenant with them. And then the next place we see the light appear is when God instructs them to make a tabernacle, which is a, a, gather, a worship space where he would meet with them. And he instructed them to put in the worship space a very specific lampstand, lantern, to remind them of the light of the presence of God. And when they came to worship, they'd be reminded that they were in the presence of light and that light was within the place of worship. Now... What's interesting about seeing how, and then it, I'm going to go farther into the images uh, in farther series about um, the prophets play with it, the psalmists play with it. You can do a lot of poetry, um, especially with some of the Advent readings. Uh, the people who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. But fundamentally, what happens after this point 
is that the symbol of the presence of God being light changes in the New Testament because you have this extraordinary verse in the first verse of the Gospel of John, um, which assigns light, the characteristic of light, to a human being for the first time ever. And it was Jesus, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Um, the I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to actually look it up. It's John 1. I do it from memory every um, Christmas because the lights are all out and y'all are with candlelight. And there was one time I got like half of it wrong and nobody noticed. (laughs) I'm not going to get it wrong this time. This is John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was what? He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Without him, not one thing came into being. This is a reference to creation. What has come into being in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so this is, how, this is the beginning of this is the famous, I am the light of the world. Jesus, so the image is that Jesus is almost like this pillar of light. So the pillar of light that guided the Israelites in Exodus is now Jesus physically walking around, guiding the people But Jesus is only on the earth for a particular number of years, right? Then Jesus dies and is resurrected. And then what happens after that is a body of people come together. And they're waiting and they're praying in a place called an upper room. And then the Holy Spirit descends like fire upon the people who are waiting and praying. And so that image of light comes back. But now it's not in a tabernacle, and it's not a temple, and it's not in a pillar, and it's not in a person, it's in a community. And this image is like the lampstand from back here has become the community, which now reflects the light of God to the world. And that is the image that that dominates the entire New Testament, So if you read in Revelation, there is overtly this image of the church as the lampstand. But then if you read in the other epistles, in the other gospels, the I am the light of the world and therefore you should be the light of the world is this ongoing theme of the people who are in the Holy Spirit comprising the body of Christ are the means by which God is reflecting his light into the world in this age. The means by which God is reflecting the light into the world in this age. Remember what light means. Light means you can see the world accurately. Light means you know what to fear and what not to fear. Light means you know how to walk and how not to walk. Light means that you can actually see the world you're living in. And the image of the church is not that we're the sunrise, because we're not. But in a world of darkness... By the grace and glory of God, we can be a lamp. We can be something. We can be a flickering to cast off the shadows, to assure people the sunrise is coming, and to give some level of clarity to the world in which we live so that the presence of God is somehow known even in the darkness. Now that is... It's an extraordinary image. It's an extraordinary image. It's an extraordinary image, especially if you think back on what it means to actually be in the darkness, right? Um, What you want most when you're in the darkness is the sun to come up. But if you have a lamp, it's better than nothing, right? If I have a lamp, I can't see everything, but I can see this. If I have a lamp, I can't see the whole landscape, but I know that I'm not going to walk off of a cliff because I can see the cliff before it comes. The image of the church is that the presence of God shines enough that we can see the world the way God does, that we can see the reality of the world in which we live. And we can help shine that reality to the world. Now, here's where it's going to get fun, guys. Here's where it's going to get fun. What does it mean to see our world the way it actually is? Right? 
What does it mean to be afraid of what we should be afraid of and not afraid of the things that we should not fear? What does it mean to prioritize the things that God prioritizes? What does it mean to walk the way we should walk? All of that comes when we really start to unpack what Jesus meant when he says, you are the light of the world. You are the ones reflecting the light of God so that the world can see the world as it actually is. That's what we're going to be unpacking. And I'll tell you what, it makes a huge, huge difference in the way you live. Because the truth of the matter is, everyone, I think, does fundamentally understand the nature of the world differently. We all fear different things. We all prioritize different things. We all live our lives in different ways. And as real as our emotions can sometimes be, the objective spiritual reality that God has set is still there for what the nature of the world actually is. I will say, I am a terrible parent when it comes to being sympathetic toward my child's feelings when I feel like the feelings aren't valid. (laughs) Which which cues you in. To, how, to, to a lot of my parenting style there. I'm super sympathetic if she, like, you know, falls and skins her knee, right? That's, that's a good reason to cry. But if you're terrified of something that you shouldn't be terrified of, I'm, I'm like this much sympathetic, and then I'm like, okay, it's time to get over this now. Because there's nothing to be afraid of, right? And so I want to explain to her... <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid of. And yes, I know it doesn't work that way. It obviously hasn't been working that way, so it doesn't stop me from trying, though. But the truth of the matter is, every single one of us has this tendency, apart from the presence of God, to live in the world we think it is and not the world as it is. And to be dominated by fears and priorities that are not real, that are not valid, to walk timidly and tenderly when we're actually on a straight path and to run when we're actually on the edge of a cliff that we don't even see is there, the presence of God is what allows us to see the world the way it is and that is the only thing that allows us to live lives worth living. Because you know what it looks like to see someone who is running, running, running and they run off a cliff they didn't even know was there, right? And you know what it looks like to see someone who is so terrified. But there is no reason to be afraid. Not a real one. Not an eternal one. Not from the presence and the the perspective of God. Not a real reason. The light of the presence of God within the body of Christ is a lamp that allows you to see your life the way God has made it. And that gift then allows us to live our lives the way God would have us live. And the gift of the world is it allows us to proclaim what God would have us proclaim so that others can also see the world God has made. Now, my favorite... My favorite incarnation of this image comes at the very end because like all biblical images, they start and they develop and they conclude. Uh, Water does this, light does this, bread does this. All of these images, they start in a particular way and they develop, develop, develop. And then we always have some kind of great wrap up in Revelation. And this one comes in Revelation 21. Um, So Revelation 21, we have the new heavens and the new earth. We have the New Jerusalem. Um, we have the description of God's people, the bride of Christ, um, coming, and everything is made well. So this is the new creation. This is the everything is made well. Everything is finished. The story has been finished. Verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb. You remember that the temple, the tabernacle, were the places of meeting with God. God had made the whole of creation to be his dwelling place. And when the exile happened, uh, exile from Eden happened, he was separated from his creation. The earth was plunged into darkness. And so the temple and the tabernacle were little spots of light where the presence of God could come. And you remember that spot of light grew into the church where the presence of God could come within the church. And what he's, we're saying now in Revelation 22, in the new creation, I saw no temple in the city. Because they don't need it. 
the temple of the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of nations. Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abominations or falsehoods, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God is there, and they have no need of sun or moon, for the presence of God is their sun. God, the end of all things, is the sun comes up again, right? And it's not just a lamp, it's not just a lantern, it's not just a candle, but there is a sunrise by which all things are made clear. And everything that we couldn't understand in this lifetime is made clear, And everything that we didn't know in this lifetime is made clear. And everything that just didn't make sense to us in this lifetime is made clear because the sun has come up and we can see God as God is and the world as the world is and the new creation as God has made it to be. And all will be well. And all will be well. And all manners of things will be well. But before that day comes, God has not left us without light. So throughout this Series, we're going to be unpacking what that means. What does it mean for you to be a part of the light of the world? What does it mean for you to live your life in a way that reflects the world God has actually made? What does it mean for you to walk well in the presence of the Lord in the way that actually shows others? what the world God has made look like? What does it mean for you to be a part of this lamp that has been offered within a dark world until the sunrise comes? Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we are so, so grateful for all that you've given us. We are so grateful that you have not left us without hope and without guidance. We are so grateful that even when we do not understand, yet you have shown us enough to keep us walking. As a Holy Spirit, come. May we stay within your light that we can then reflect your light. May we stay within your presence that we can reflect your presence. And may we see clearly enough how you view our lives, that we might be able to show the world how you view the world. May we fear what is rightly to be feared, and may we be courageous when we should be courageous, and may we walk in the ways that lead to life eternal. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. This we pray as we say together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.